Hello and Happy New Year. Welcome back to another episode of the Bill of Rights Institute's Close Reads, where we take a look at different historical documents and break them apart and look at their essential components. I'm Kirk Higgins, and I am excited today to be exploring the Articles of Confederation with you. So let's dive in. So the Articles of Confederation was the first governing document of the United States. So in effect, it was sort of the first constitution. It was a way in which the 13 colonies, now independent states, were able to coordinate their actions and work together as a confederation. We'll talk more about that word confederation in a minute, but I like to always stop and kind of take a step back and think about a broader question. So today, as we're going through the articles, we're going to also be thinking about how the Articles of Confederation differ from the Constitution. If you'd like to see more about the Constitution, I did another explain video where we took a look at that document, so you can go back and review it if you want. But first, let's take a look at some historical context. So, of course, we all know July 4, 1776 is when the colonies declared themselves independent in the Declaration of Independence. They actually had voted on that back in June or started debating it in June of 1776. And nearly the day after they voted or started debating independence, they also started drafting this document called the Articles of Confederation. That debate took a long time from July of 1776 till November of 1777 when they finally said, all right, great, we got it. Here's the new document. It was then sent out to the states for ratification in a similar way that the constitution would be, but it took another several years for that to finally be ratified. It wasn't until March, or sorry, excuse me, February of 1781 that the articles were finally ratified. And so they came into effect on March 1st, 1781. Why is that important? The American Revolution was still going on. So from 1776 till 1781, there's all kinds of different battles and conflicts going on. Uh, there's problems going on with supplies. All this kind of stuff is happening all while they're trying to debate and come up with this new form of government that's going to coordinate the activities of all the states. It's not until 1783 that that war finally comes to an end with the Treaty of Paris. The Treaty of Paris was actually voted on and ratified by the Articles of Confederation in Congress. That formally ended the war. So you could say that the Articles of Confederation is actually what helped us win the American Revolution. Pretty cool. Um, there's other big pieces of legislation that sometimes people don't think about happening under the Articles. Um, the Land Ordinance of 1785, which I discussed um, in my Northwest Ordinance video, um, as well as the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which I also uh, discussed, uh, were ways of figuring out how we're going to divide up and sell off Western lands that were claimed by the United States. Um, another major event that happened uh, was Shays' Rebellion in 1786. Uh, which was uh, a rebellion of uh, individuals who were upset about having to pay taxes to any kind of government. Uh, and so they rebelled. And that was something that started to show where this document, this confederation had some weaknesses. Um, and of course, that then led to the Annapolis Convention. And what I don't have on here is the even more famous Philadelphia Convention, where the new constitution was drafted that eventually replaced the Articles of Confederation. But what is in this document, the Articles of Confederation? How did it function? Why was it so weak? Well, the only way we can find that out is actually looking at the document. So let's take a look. So it starts off with this, what I think is a, a fascinating entry. So if you remember in the constitution, there's a famous preamble, we the people of the United States. Well, here we're already seeing something different. To all to whom these presents shall come, we the undersigned delegates of the states affixed to our names send greetings. The Autos Confederation and Perpetual Union between the states, and it goes on the list of states. So what's going on here? Already we can see that these are delegates of the states. They're not we the people, it's not individuals who are gonna be voting on this, but as the actual delegates of the states who are coming together to form this confederation at the state level. So whereas our constitution currently um, exists uh, it, with a system of federalism, which has national power, state power, and all of those are actually on the individual, here we're only talking about a government that's affecting um, relationships between the national government and the states themselves. That's it. So with the preamble out of the way, let's get into the actual document. So here they, they style the Confederacy as the United States of America. Great, we now have a name. Each state retains its sovereignty. So here again, we can see this coming up again. This is really important for understanding this document. Each state retains its sovereignty, freedom and independence in every power and jurisdiction, which is not by this Confederation expressly delegated to the United States. So the idea of express delegation of powers is something that comes up in the constitution again, right? Um, in article one, section eight, that delineates out uh, the powers of Congress. It says Congress shall have the power herein granted. And the argument goes, 
that those are the things that Congress is limited to. So it's expressly stated. Well, here, this was even more restrictive. It was that the states retain all sovereignty. Uh, so as opposed to the current constitution where the states are underneath the constitution itself by the supremacy clause, so states themselves have the power, they are sovereign. They're the ones that are delegating this authority uh, to the new national government. And then it goes in that if it's not expressly delegated in this document, then it's done. And then it goes on to say um, that the states hereby enter a firm league of friendship. So not very strong, but we're a firm, we're friends. You know, we're gonna get along, we're gonna cooperate, we're gonna work together, um, but it's not this sort of lasting strong bond that the new constitution would later establish. That sort of becomes a challenge. Um, and one of the reasons that the Annapolis Convention eventually happens is that this government that's underneath the Arles Confederation, although it does function, it works, there's some cooperation, it's really hard for the national government to assert its authority and to have interests of the national government um, have you know, teeth in a way, right? And by that, I mean, um, have the ability to really enforce what it is that it wants to do. So we've established this perpetuate mutual friendship and intercourse among the people of the different states. And so to do that, they shall be entitled to all the privileges and the immunities of the several states. So this is really important because this is essentially saying that if you're a citizen in one state, you're a citizen in every state. And so that is, you know, that, that, that's gonna be shared, that it's not gonna be sovereign to the state like of different countries. So if you were in Europe, obviously, you know, a um, citizen of England wouldn't have the same privileges, right? Meaning um, opportunities or things that the law affords you um, and immunities, so protections of those laws. If you're a citizen in England, you wouldn't necessarily have those same things in France, right? They're very different countries. Here we're talking about you can go between all of these different states um, and uh, you are recognized as a citizen of all the states. And it goes on to say the same, that if you're charged of a crime, um, then you'll also be charged in every state. So you can't just escape justice by hopping over the border from New Jersey into Pennsylvania. You're still going to be wanted there. Uh, and it also says that full faith and credit shall be given to each of the states the records, acts, and judicial proceedings of the court. So if, they, if there's a finding in one state, it's going to be recognized in another state. So this is really important because this is sort of a lot of legalese, but this is actually what forms this confederation together. These, this is the nuts and bolts of how it's going to function, what it means for individual citizens, and from a legal standpoint, how it is that these different relationships are going to take place. So now already we're in Article 5. So if we take a step back and think about it, uh, the Constitution only has seven articles, and in those seven, remember it outlines a legislature in Article 1, an executive branch in Article 2, and a judiciary in Article 3, and then talks about some other things in 5, 6, and 7 um, that are important that establish sort of the relationships of the union. Here we're seeing a very different structure. This document is outlining sort of what this union is going to be first and foremost. Instead of having a legislature, it's outlining what it's going to be. Um, and then it's going through and looking at the different ways that it's going to afford that power and being very guarded and limited in what it is that it's going to cover. So in Article 5 here, um, it goes through and talks about um, all of the things that, uh, that the Congress itself is going to be able to debate. One thing to note here, it says, um, this is talking about how the delegates are actually going to work and what it's going to mean to vote. So in our current constitution, we have the Congress, and we have Congress, which is made up of the House and the Senate. House is voted on um, broadly, and your representation is based generally on population of the states. Senators, everybody has two. Um, here, there's a very different system. So each state, and you'll see it down here, um, each state has one vote. So every state is going to have one vote. Uh, each state is going to determine how it is that it sends those those representatives to Congress, um, and then it's in, uh, and that's just going to be it. Um, so it's one vote per state, so 13 total votes. All the states vote on when the Congress is going to do something, um, and that's how this Congress is going to function. Um, this talks about when they're going to meet, um, that they're going to meet once a year on the first Monday of November. Um, and then they have this great clause down here talking about the freedom of speech and debate in Congress shall not be impeached or questioned in any court or place um, out of Congress, right? So this is interesting because it is an explicit protection of free speech, but specifically for Congress, members of Congress. So this has roots back in the English tradition, members of Congress having certain immunities, um, protecting free speech and debate on the floor of the chamber where that debate is taking place. Here, they're explicitly calling that out. But again, remember, this isn't like in the Constitution or the First Amendment, which was ratified until after the Constitution was in effect in 1791, um, but they protected the right of people to have free speech. Um, then it was that the federal government could not violate that. But here, they're not talking about people having a right to free speech, but they're talking about these members in Congress have a right to free speech. 
So here, I'm gonna get really brief because these sections are long and a lot. And remember, we're now passing that seven article mark that we have in the constitution. Um, but these next series in six, seven, and eight um, all go into what it is that the states can't do and what it is that the Congress can do. Um, so, so, you know, no, no state without consent of Congress of the United States in Congress assembled. And then it lists and it goes through a list. And there's a lot that's listed there. Um, but again, it's this expressly delegating, trying to get so that everybody is understanding what it is that this Congress can do and what it cannot. Um, seven starts talking about land forces when you're able to raise an army. Um, during Shays Rebellion, this became a problem. Um, this was a challenge. They weren't able to raise a good national response to the uprising that was happening. And as a result, state militias had to come and put it down. That was one example of many um, that individuals, again, saw and said, hey, this government is so limited that it's not powerful enough to actually do what we need it to do, which is maintain national interest and help the states cooperate. Um, here, it's important, it says in section eight here, all charges of war and other expenses shall be defrayed out of a common treasury. So there's going to be a common pool of money that we're all pulling from, um, and that the taxes, that money will come from um, the value of the land within the states. Um, now, actually collecting these taxes became a lot more challenging. Getting the states to actually give up their funds uh, was not easy. And again, was another one of these examples where uh, the what later became the Federalists said, hey, this old constitution is not strong enough. What we need is something stronger that can compel the states uh, to actually give us this money. Otherwise, we don't have a treasury to uphold this national interest, which was a challenge. So going on in um, 9, 10, and 11 here, um, here in 9, you finally get to the place where, and this is after nine sections, you finally get to the place where the powers of Congress are delineated out. This section is very long. It goes into a lot of detail. I'm not going to do that here. But again, the important part is that it's being expressly stated that they're going through and saying exactly what it is that Congress can do. Here in 10, we're finally seeing uh, what it's going to mean to have an executive. So the executive is sort of a committee with one president as lead, uh, but that president is the head of a committee that has been authorized to work on behalf of the states in very specific instances if it's needed when it's when Congress isn't assembled. So when everybody's off doing their thing, uh, you know, this, this committee can come together and make some very limited decisions if it has to. Um, but again, that's very different than the singular executive that we have in the Constitution. Singular just meaning one. We have one president and a vice president. Here, there is a president, but he sits at the head of a committee of the states. Um, so it functions very differently. Um, that coming together actually proved to be a challenge um, for the ratification or, or um, sort of legal authorization of the Treaty of Paris, which ended the American Revolution, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Congress didn't come together. Um, they had to kind of pull people together to get that assembly done so they could vote and say that, yeah, no, we'd agree to this treaty. Um, so again, just showing that, that there were some challenges um, in, in helping this to work together. Um, in 11 here, I think this is interesting. Um, Canada acceding to this, conf this confederation and adjoining in the measures of the United States shall be admitted and entitled to all the advantages of this union, but no other colony shall be admitted into the same unless such admission be agreed to by nine states. So what's that saying? They're inviting Canada in. Canada wants to join this confederation. They are more than welcome to. Obviously, um, Canada was also a British colony at this time. Uh, its history was different. It had been French originally and had been given over to the British um, after a, a war, the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War um, in 1763 when that had ended. Uh, and here they're saying, Canada, come join us. Uh, but anybody else, we're going to have to get together as a Congress and vote. Um, in the nine of 13. So there we're noting it's the two thirds rule. So two thirds of the state that comes up again in the constitution. When we're talking about ratification of the constitution, nine of the 13 states had to ratify that document in order for it to become the new legal constitution. Um, and so that precedent had been set here um, in the Articles of Confederation. Quickly, we'll go through 11 and, or uh, sorry, 12 and 13 here. Um, all money borrowed, we're going to recognize the debt of states that had happened beforehand. Um, this assumption um, of debts became a big topic of conversation, um, but that is listed out here. Um, and then in 13, um, every state shall abide by the determination of the United States Congress assembled on all questions which by this confederation are submitted to them. So if we send you a question, you've got to think about it. You're legally obligated to think about it, debate it, discuss it. And, and, and take action on it. So they're compelling the states here to, to do that. So there was some ability for the, for the national government um, under the Articles of Confederation to compel the states to do things, but it's very limited, very particular items. 
Uh, and then I included just this long closure because I think it's it's great. So this is the rest of section 13. Um, and they go on to sort of conclude with this very, um, very much a, a flowery sort of uh, embellished um, conclusion that you don't necessarily see in the constitution. I think in the constitution, as embellished as it gets is that preamble, we the people of the United States in order to ordain and establish that that's about as far as it gets. Here, you know, you have this phrase, know ye that we the undersigned delegates by virtue of the power and authority given to us for that purpose do by these presence in the name and in behalf of the respective constituents. And it goes on, but it's essentially saying, we've been delegated this task, we have now done it, we are sending it to you, the states to ratify. And once it's done, you know, it will then be in force. Um, and it goes on to list the names of the delegates after. Um, so that's it. That's the entirety of the Arles Confederation. Um, as we saw, it differs um, quite a bit from the Constitution, both in how, um, it, how it compels the states to act underneath this national government, um, but also in how you know, its legislature is set up, what its executive is doing. And notice there was no mention of courts. There is no national court system um, underneath the Arles Confederation. Um, so those are a few ways. Again, um, and we have lots of resources on this. We'll include a few links in the description if you want to read about the Annapolis Convention, where things started to break apart, why it is that uh, many individuals like James Madison and Alexander Hamilton and others were frustrated by this governing document. And in their opinion, they were unable uh, to get it to function as it needed to, um, to ensure that uh, that trade was happening in a way that was uh, fair, that they could negotiate contracts overseas, but that they could also negotiate treaties. All of that was, it was a cumbersome process. It was really difficult. Um, so they eventually moved um, on to the Philadelphia Convention and made a new constitution. So I hope that was interesting. If it was for review and a refresher, or if it was brand new to you, or you've never actually just taken the time to look at the specifics of the Autos Confederation. Um, as I mentioned, this is only excerpts. I did really shorten it up, um, but I do encourage you take a look at the document. It's pretty interesting. Um, there was a debate over ratification of the constitution for a reason. Many thought that that governing document was functioning okay, and that that was as strong as the national government needed to be. Obviously the states eventually came to the decision um, that it wasn't uh, and did ratify the constitution um, that did go in effect um, uh, after the Articles of Confederation. Um, but it's important to see that legacy. And I think another way to look at the Articles of Confederation is to see where it is that things were changed and tweaked, why that is. Um, you can kind of see the logic of that generation of individuals as they work to figure out how self-government ought to work, what the best protections were, how best to keep things in line. Um, and to borrow a phrase from the Federalist Papers, um, you see how that uh, the advancing science of government uh, it was able to sort of change and tweak how things were functioning. So I hope you'll join us next time. We've got a lot of different uh, materials on our YouTube channel and both on the Bill of Rights Institute website as well um, that are conversations with scholars uh, or that look at different images um, with our Bridge from the Past series. Um, and just do the same kind of thing. Do some analysis, do some review, do some conversation. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to comment. We try to respond as much as we can. Uh, and until next time, thank you for joining.